Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you're on the other side of the, the world. Welcome to the BioXL webinar number 62. Today's topic is improvement in the Gromax heterogeneous polarization, and the speaker of today is Silar Paul from the Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. I'm, hosting, I'm Alessandra Villa, and I'm hosting this webinar together with Stefan Farr from University of Edinburgh. So, something about Shilar. Shilar is a HPC researcher at the PDC, Center for High Performance Computing, that is located at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. He has a background in uh, computer science, but he has a lot of experience also in computational biophysics. He worked a lot with GPU acceleration, actually more than 10 years. He helped to reformulate key parallelism, parallel algorithm in molecular dynamics for modern processor architecture, and is also co-author of the first heterogeneous CPU GPU parallelization of Gromax. Currently, his focus is on economous task scheduling and strong scaling in molecular dynamic simulation on as a scale heterogeneous architecture. I'm very happy that he's here, and now I give him the word. So hello everyone and welcome to this uh, BioXL webinar where I will be talking about uh, the improvements in the heterogeneous parallelization in Gromax. And uh, first I will give a bit of a background to why, um, why are we parallelizing molecular simulations and what is behind the scenes. Um, in the heterogeneous parallelization in the Gromax molecular simulation engine. And then I will follow, this will follow with the, this will be followed by a, um, description and details, some details of the most recent work that uh, we have uh, put into this uh, parallelization to improve performance, robustness, and various features of the, of the code. First, just a very brief introduction about Gromax, and because most of you probably know the code fairly well, I will not dive into too many details. Gromax is a, a molecular, classical molecular dynamics code that is uh, focused on uh, performance, flexibility. It's free for use. It's open source. It has an open development uh, scheme. And one of the, one of the key things that it's known for is its uh, bottom-up performance optimizations and the broad support for, for uh, very efficient algorithms and, uh, and a diverse set of uh, parallelization schemes. So why do we parallelize? Uh, why do we need to parallelize in, in, um, at this day and age? And what is the role of parallelization um, in computational science and specifically in molecular simulations? This plot, it might be a little bit um, busy and complex, but I would like to draw your attention to, to two features of it. Uh, the black curve that I'm pointing at shows the number of logical CPU cores um, over time. And most important is, is the green curve, which shows the frequency of microprocessors. Um, as you can see, for until around the mid 2000s, the, the number of logical cores stayed constant while the number of uh, while the frequency of, of processors uh, shown in green has has steadily increased um, this was what provided the performance improvements in most computational codes including molecular simulations and researchers could just sit back and wait for the next generation of algorithm of, of architectures and focus on algorithms and methods uh, to improve uh, performance of simulations. However, this scaling has stopped and performance has translated into an increase of number of cores. And these cores can only be made use of by parallelization. And that is why parallelization is, is key since the mid 2000s and it's increasing in its importance because parallelism is presented at, in, in, at multiple levels, all the way from, from the level of, of, of multiple nodes in a cluster to multiple CPUs in a node, uh, combined these days very often with GPUs. And within a node, we have cores and accelerators and vector units. So it's a complex landscape. And this landscape is changing fast. 
as as you probably already know, uh, exascale is is here, and um, the major exascale challenge is the increase, the vast increase in parallelism, and an increase in complexity uh, how this parallelism is presented in terms of of of, of the hardware, um, an increasing diversity in terms of architectures and heterogeneity that we will talk more about uh, is here to stay. So in order to, to exploit this hardware parallelism, we need multiple levels of parallelization. And the way this multiple levels of parallelization is expressed um, is, is, is to expose parallelism using algorithms and express parallelism in the implementation to map it to, to, to each level of hardware. For instance, as illustrated here, we have on the highest level an ensemble parallelization. Each member of the ensemble may have domain decomposition, uh, which is then further uh, uh, parallelized over CPUs, uh, CPU cores, GPUs, SIMD units using data parallelism. Uh, what is very important here is choosing the right granularity and the abstraction, and that is where our work is focused uh, quite frequently. So what I, what I would like to highlight here is a, is a very important feature of, of the various heterogeneous hardware uh, and where, heter where by heterogeneous I mean a combination of CPUs and GPUs or CPUs and accelerators. And note that there has been for a long time a wide variety of, of uh, CPUs and GPUs, large CPUs, large GPUs, uh, uh, often large CPUs uh, in a server with a smaller GPU. And the, in gray, I wanted to represent the, the relative speed of the interconnect of the connection between the CPU and GPU, which represents how fast the data can be exchanged between these components. Same applies to servers. Uh, early mid to, uh, to 2010s, we had one CPU and one GPU or one CPU and two GPUs with a fairly fat link between the two. How did this change later? As you might notice, uh, the most prominent change that I illustrate here is that GPUs, GPUs became big, but even more prominent is that these links between CPUs and GPUs has become small. And this is, this is a, a hallmark of, of, of a lot of the, the hardware development um, over the last 10 years. And it's made diffic more difficult making use of such hardware because this link, this gray line in between CPU and GPU, uh, which is typically a so-called PCI Express interconnect has stagnated and has not increased in performance while there has been a big leap in compute performance. And here, uh, don't look too much at the details, but I want to just show the big, the, the big leap in raw performance on the top and the bottom on the bottom this this is the one of our parallel kernels uh, in gromax and and over uh, three four generations of, of this kernel the application kernel uh, the pair interaction kernel has increased in performance by nearly 10x while this interconnected gray link i showed you has 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 not really improved much has uh, it's 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 bandwidth uh, its performance has stagnated for nearly eight years in addition uh, what i want to add to this is 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 the background uh, suddenly the the previous picture has become more colorful and this this is uh, uh, representing the diverse, the increasing diversity in architectures. There are AMD GPUs coming up. There, Intel has, is releasing GPUs. So more and more vendors are are uh, uh, showing up to the to the and and competing in this world. Um, in addition to that, HPC nodes, which many of you might be using and many of you might might interface with, have have also been increasing in complexity and come in in various shapes and forms. With multiple types of interconnects, and what I would like to highlight here, which 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 we will discuss a little bit more later, how the the blue blocks, the CPUs and the GPUs are are connected to each other, but then but then GPUs tend to get connected between each other as well in in compute nodes in order to exact exactly to avoid that that thin black or gray link between the CPU and GPU and be able to rely on a, on, a, on a fast communication between GPUs. 
this is this is also uh, going to be reflected in the next generation exascale architectures like the AMD or the Intel exascale architectures that will be present in Lumine, Frontier, or PVC's Dardo, or the Intel's machines in Aurora. There will be a complex interconnects both inside the node and across nodes, and we need to get ready for this. We need to ready our applications and algorithms to, to be able to, to utilize these machines efficiently. So what I want to illustrate here is, is, is the molecular dynamics algorithm, a molecular dynamics, so-called molecular dynamics step, which is which consists of a sequence or, or a collection of, of, of tasks, uh, force tasks that need to be computed as shown in colorful boxes, and then an integration and constraining finishes the, 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 the main iteration. And then we, we repeat that. Uh, um, in an inner loop and occasionally every 50 or to 200 iterations, we do a decomposition step. And we want to do this as fast as possible. And why do we want to do this as fast as possible? That's because we want to close the, the time scale gap between our time step, which needs to be small, and the real world uh, time scales that we need to simulate. And this, this is the main goal of parallelization in studying molecular systems to, to, to tackle this time or sometimes length scale challenge. And this typically requires strong scaling and increasingly ensemble scaling. So just to give you a, a bit of a, a, an insight into where the computational costs are here, I show the floating point operations in a pie chart on the left of the most computationally expensive tasks, you can see the non-bonded pair interactions and PMEs next. And then we translate this into, into a wall time breakdown. Then we see that, that, that things change slightly. That is because some tasks scale better, some tasks perform better and scale better more with the, the number of flops and others less so. But, but the picture is still very similar. The non-bonded tasks and the, the PME and bonded, so, so our, our, our force computations take most of the, the computational time. One important thing, especially when it comes to, to heterogeneous parallelization, is the structure of this algorithm. We do not need to sequentially compute these force tasks. We can compute them typically in any order, either concurrently or, or, or sequentially. But then when we have computed the forces, we need to do a reduction step. So we converge and reduce to get the forces so that which which then can be used for integration this will be an important feature in in any heterogeneous code that 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 tries to to do task based parallelization because it allows um, doing these force computations in parallel so a quick summary of of, of the chromex parallelization before moving on to to the concrete improvements we have made during the recent years. Um, as I mentioned, Gromex employs a multi-level hierarchical parallelization in order to target each level of hardware parallelism individually on the intranode. Um, it uses uh, OpenMP multi-threading, uh, which combines, allows combining a set of CPU cores uh, to work along uh, a GPU uh, GPUs are used using APIs, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And there is also SIMD parallelization, which, which allows uh, great performance on CPU using uh, um, library abstractions in order to allow portability. Uh, internode, we use MPI, and there are advanced features like dynamic load balancing and task balancing, which, which improve scaling and performance. One important thing I wanted to uh, mention is that uh, when we started working on bringing Romax onto GPU accelerators and, and, and heterogeneous architectures, an algorithm redesign was necessary. And this algorithm redesign was, was what unlocked the, the world of, of, of GPU accelerators and allowed Romax to perform well. And this algorithm redesign really had to go come from, from a bottom-up uh, rethinking of algorithms all the way to, to, to adjusting uh, domain decomposition and load balancing schemes. And what I want to highlight is, is one, of the, one of the interesting and, and exciting algorithms where, where we face this issue that um, 
when we offload it to GPUs or or parallelized over CPUs, we have to trade cost in in between the blue box and the green box. If we made the the pair search less often, this outer calling the outer loop less often, then we we increased the cost directly on in the no bonded forces. And in order to 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 avoid this inconvenient trade off, we went back to the algorithms and used an accuracy based. Uh, uh, approach to create a so-called dual pair list algorithm where the data generated the pair list and domain decomposition data generated during the blue blue phase of the algorithm we keep that for much longer instead of 20 to 100 50 to 400 even 500 iterations but in, instead of 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 this resulting in a very large non-bonded computational cost we mitigate that by trading this cost and 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 do a so-called dynamic pruning. This dynamic pruning step can be done often, and on the next slide I'll show you why it can be done often. This can be done often because the way we laid out the algorithm is that we create a large uh, pair list for this large interaction sphere, and that large sphere, if, if we would compute interactions within that sphere, then we will be computing a lot of zeros because because there will be a lot of non-interacting atoms. But instead, we create a smaller inner list shown by the dashed green line and periodically reprune, so reduce this large list of created from the, from the outer list to the inner list and compute fair forces with that. And because data access uh, is, is optimized by our uh, pair interaction algorithms and the pair search code, this repruning is very, very cheap and it can be done very frequently and it allows us to, to, to create this accuracy based uh, uh, balancing between different algorithmic phases. What I would like to spend a, a bit of time on is, is, is discussing the evolution of the GPU hardware and API supporting Romex. Uh, where have we come from and where are we now? Um, the work started early 2010s, uh, uh, late uh, 2009, 2010. And it took quite some time to, to, to port the, the, the initial code to GPUs and, and tune the code for, for heterogeneous parallelization. Then later on, OpenCL uh, parallelization was added in order to improve the portability and robustness. With that, the robustness of the code, this was later improved for, for NVIDIA and Intel architectures. New features were added throughout the years, improving communication and offloading more code. And what more, most recently uh, we have wor been working on is, is, is new APIs um, and better support for various Chromex uh, core features and functionalities. And with the latest release, we have further optimized uh, GPU direct communication, which I will be talking about. Um, we have integrated new distributed uh, uh, FFT backends, and quite excitingly, we have uh, we have full, uh, uh, nearly full support uh, in our SQL backend for the GPU resident loop, which will be uh, the main means of targeting Intel and uh, AMD architectures, starting from the second half of this year. So to compare these current API support in Gromax, on NVIDIA, we have, we have a very mature CUDA and it's, it's the bread and butter of, of, uh, um, of programming GPUs, but only for NVIDIA. It's not portable and therefore um, we have for a long time invested into OpenCL, which, which is fairly mature and it's an open standard. Um, but it's a bit awkward to use in, in the modern C++ code and therefore um, new development has shifted to SQL and we had early support in 2021 and it will be, as I mentioned, the primary uh, means of supporting Intel uh, architectures and the AMD architectures from Q3, Q2 planned. Um, it's still an underactive development because not all hardware is available. So next. I would like to explain why did we choose uh, heterogeneous parallelization. The main reason for that was instead of just choosing homogeneous parallelization where 
where we forget about CPUs and only use the GPUs. <clears throat> well, the main reason, there were two main reasons, flexibility and performance. Um, we wanted to maintain the versatility of Gromax and we wanted to support, keep supporting the majority of the features and doing a full port with a large code with a million lines of, 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 of source code and a very versatile feature set is very difficult. It's near, nearly impossible. Performance uh, can be, additional performance can be obtained as I'll show shortly if we allow flexibility in the parallelization. We wanted portability based on abstraction layers, which, which allow easy porting of, of, of to new architectures because we knew and we, we anticipated that things will be changing fast. Uh, GPUs will be the main drivers of, of computation, but, but they, there will not be a stable foundation of, of, of APIs and programming models. This, of course, comes with challenges in finding a good balance between flexibility and complexity. And uh, because we have fast CPU code on the CPU side, it's often worth using, but moving data around is difficult, as I, as I have uh, illustrated with the thick and thin interconnect lines. Load balancing between different compute units is difficult. And so therefore, um, we have a complex set of, of, of problems to solve. And the way we try to tackle this, this uh, over the years is the transfer on the top, uh, I show the homogeneous scheme where everything is executed on the CPU to uh, initially a so-called force offload parallelization where we gradually offloaded more and more force computations to the GPU to, to address the, the the faster and faster uh, to make use of the faster and faster uh, GPUs that were um, coming out during the late mid mid and late 2010s. However, we had to later shift to a so-called GPU resident parallelization for for very good reasons that I will uh, come to next. So the challenges with the force of load is is that we needed this data movement. Here I illustrate uh, uh, the color boxes, compute force, forces, forces on the GPU, but then everything gets brought back to the CPU and these black boxes illustrate the reduction where we sum up all the forces before integration. Now, as GPUs get faster and faster, Andal's law dictates that, that uh, uh, the cost in integration that during which the GPU is left idle will be increasing. In addition, as I illustrated earlier, Moving data between CPU and GPU has already has also been becoming uh, increasingly costly relative to computation, and this this was becoming major bottleneck. So this is why the GPU resident mode was born, where we prioritize keeping instead of trying to balance load between CPU and GPU, we prioritize trying to keep the GPU busy as much as possible. We try to just launch a lot of work from the CPU onto the GPU and maintain the forces and coordinates um, on the GPU as long as possible. So this is of course a trade-off because we're now we're leaving the CPU empty, but it also leaves us an opportunity with, with, with performance for performance, for obtaining more performance by making use of the CPU. And also it, it maintains our ability. And in fact, it even, better enables us to support uh, less common features, which may not be offloaded to the GPU, but may be very valuable to many researchers, like pooling or free energies, which now can be taken, uh, taken can be taken care of by, by the GPU and can, by the CPU, and can be computed on the CPU while the GPU is, is busy with the main bulk of the work, as shown here in the magenta box, and typically, in most cases, the CPU will be done well before the GPU needs that data. And now the, the, the reduction and the integration will only depend on, on uh, uh, mostly GPU work and possibly if, if there are features on the CPU, features requiring compute on the CPU and some smaller amount of CPU work. What, what this also allows, uh, um, is, is the next topic I would like to talk about that is um, 
our data now resides on the GPU. Therefore, I mentioned earlier and I showed the, the, the topology and, and, and the, the, the complex uh, interconnects on, on high performance computing um, uh, nodes. Now, before that, um, let's take a quick look at, at what, what performance looks like in, in this, this uh, in the different heterogeneous offload modes. And here, the different colors represent offloading more and more computation to the GPU, where black line is the CPU only performance on a single node with a typical bimolecular system. And what we see going from red to blue to, to light blue to green is that the performance keeps increasing because we have a fast GPU. The, the more we offload, the, the more performance we get. However, note that we have the number of CPU cores as, as the x-axis. And this is where, where our heterogeneous parallelization flexibility comes into play. The, the dark yellow line crosses the green line. If we have sufficient number of cores from around three to four cores, maintaining the CPU, uh, the ability to, to execute code and, and do work on the CPU is a benefit because we can get more performance by leaving the bonded interactions in the CPU. So this is how we benefit from, from heterogeneous parallelization. Now moving on to the so-called direct GPU communication, which is essentially enabled by, by um, primarily by the, the new architectures which have um, various interconnects directly between GPUs, excluding the CPUs to avoid these slow connections between CPU and GPU. And we essentially have two flavors of this, one with our so-called Red MPI and one with CUDA or MPI. But most important is that both aim to do efficient communication between the different uh, uh, accelerators in the system. This work was carried out um, in an NVIDIA co-design project. And uh, now I would like to highlight the main benefits of this, this uh, uh, direct GPU communication mode. So what I show here is, is the earlier node layout of a, of a modern GPU system where we have these, these fast green links between the GPUs. Now, before we had this functionality, what we would have to do when communicating data between, uh, for, for instance, for Halo Exchange between GPU 0 and GPU 3, is that we had to first go to the CPU 0, then to the CPU 1, because that is where our MPI rank will reside, that is, has the GPU 3 associated to it, and then copy the data to the GPU 3. So these, this is called staged data movement, and this staged data movement will go through these this slow uh, gray links. And it will completely ignore the fast links between the GPUs. Whereas by using the direct GPU communication features, because our coordinate data is already on the GPU, we do the integration and the new coordinates are already there, we could communicate between GPUs but we need to make use of these special communication libraries. Even when we don't have such fast links, like, uh, like the MVLink interconnect, we can have some benefit because we don't need to explicitly in the application copy to the CPU, then copy to the other CPU, then copy to the GPU. And with that, uh, block our CPU from being able to compute, for instance, free energy interactions. With this new direct GPU communication mode, we can just tell the communication layer, move the data between GPU zero and GPU two here, and then move on and start computing, for instance, pool or free energy interactions. And that is a benefit that can be a benefit even on systems which don't have these high performance interconnects. Now, where this becomes even more important is when we have multiple nodes. And now I show a node on the left and half of a node on the right. And the same thing happens when we, when we need to stage, then we need to copy data 
if we want to communicate from, from the left node GPU3 to the right node's GPU2, we need to first copy data to the CPU, then hop onto the network, then hop through the network of the to the to the network interface network card in the other node, then hop to the CPU, and then hop to the GPU. Now instead of, of having to, to make these many hops, we can just tell the communication library um, communicate this data from GPU3 on my node to GPU2 on this other node, and the communication will proceed. These hops will happen, but without the involvement of the CPU and without the involvement of the application coordinating the staging. So what this looks like in a, in a timeline-based picture um, is, is the following, and here focus on the, on the vertical lines which represent the data movement. And here, this is the, the, the force offload scheme where colorful boxes are on the GPU, where computing forces on the GPU, but we're moving data back and forth between CPU and GPU, and the black box reduction is on the CPU together with the integration constraints. Now, when we move our reduction and integration with the GPU resident mode, we, are, we, we managed to avoid some of the communication or at least overlap it with computation. But the challenge is still that these dashed lines, which represent those previous dashed lines and the previous, previous cartoons, these are the, 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 the staged communication phases. And, and these are the bottleneck in because, because this staged communication of the coordinates that I'm pointing at will delay the computation of this magenta box for instance, free energy calculations. Instead, in our implementation, we can trans, 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 um, transfer the data directly between GPUs, as shown by these, by these green lines, and with that, avoid a lot of the communication. So now you see the many of the horizontal lines, uh, sorry, the vertical lines are eliminated. And what this allows us is to essentially encapsulate the entire inner loop, including communication in some of the, the parallelization modes and hand it over to the GPU runtime, the CUDA runtime, for instance, and tell the CUDA runtime to, to, to do 100 iterations, including communication and computation and schedule it as efficiently as possible. So this opens up, uh, the path to further improvements and further optimizations, for instance, using CUDA graphs. For now, we're not making use of these features, but it's definitely unlocking uh, the performance and enabling further benefits along the, along the way. Now, MPI works a little bit differently. With MPI, we still need to stop, wait for the data to be available on the GPU, and then communicate directly from our local GPU to remote GPU. So there is still some involvement from the CPU, but the efficiency benefits are still there. So how does this look like in practice in terms of performance? Um, on the left, I show the performance with reaction, reaction field simulation because PME um, simulations cause some more complexity first. Um, as you can see, the, the blue line shows staged GPU communication. If we do, if we if we do direct GPU communication, that is the red line, we get better performance. But here, we're doing direct GPU communication without residency. When we enable GPU resident steps, as in we keep the forces and and coordinates on the GPU, then we unlock the full performance. The same pattern can be seen on the right panel uh, with PME performance, but this, this is somewhat more limited, both because uh, PME is costly, but also because PME is very hard to scale. FFTs are difficult uh, to, to scale in a distributed fashion. And uh, this is what, why we initially chose to run PME on a single dedicated GPU. And that is what you can see from, from eight GPUs, having one of them dedicated uh, to PME is sufficient, but at 16 GPUs, it's not sufficient anymore. However, 
if we look further forward uh, to the latest performance uh, features of, of the Chromax 2022, we can see the same system that is a, a 1 million atom STMV benchmark. If we run it with the reaction field only and without PME, we scale really well on, on the dual booster nodes. And if we further optimize locality and, and, and mapping to map better to the hardware, and I won't go into details, if you use these, these machines, please read the documentation because there are some tricky details in, in getting these things right. But if we optimize it further, we get, we get very good parallel perform, parallel efficiency up to 50% strong scaling parallel efficiency to 12 nodes and peaking at more than 500 milliseconds per day for a 1 million atom system only on only uh, 48 nodes. However, we don't have PME here and we want to do PME. So this was the next uh, um, NVIDIA co-design project that we worked on, um, PME decomposition, which required a distributed FFT library that was able to keep up with the rest of the code and, and at least not slow things down because FFTs are very hard to scale. So the initial support for this uh, in, in the 2022 release is somewhat limited because uh, of the lack of availability of, of various libraries. So what we support in the 2022 release is a hybrid, is, is, is hybrid mode, which uh, uses the CPUs for the distributed FFT. And we have a basic FFT support, which is a library from the US um, Exascale computing project. But this still does not unlock the full capability of the code. Um, in, in the current development version, we have much improved performance and we, we are making use of the CU FFT MP library, which is a recently released library developed by NVIDIA, which does uh, distributed FFTs. And uh, it was partially motivated by our needs. And we work closely with NVIDIA to get to good performance in this library. And a preview, um, as a preview to the performance of this, this feature on an older type of DGX1 node, you can see um, in the dash green line, the PME performance now is not limiting our, us uh, at 16 GPUs. And if we take the same performance to, to the, to the to the jewels nodes uh, that I that I showed a little bit earlier. Uh, no, sorry. This is this is on the selling cluster. Um, then we can see that that now we scale um, up to twenty four nodes, and uh, with our with our optimized uh, scheme shown on the green curve, uh, we we get an X in, in more than two hundred milliseconds per day. Um, Further improvements are planned, but this is this is already fairly good, and uh, and we expect that the next generation hardware will help to further improve this, together with the uh, improvements in the decomposition libraries, in the FFT decomposition libraries. Finally, before closing this talk, I would like to uh, mention um, work we have done on hierarchical ensemble parallelization. This is very important um, because, as most of you are familiar with, biomolecular systems are often limited in size. Biological um, biomolecules are, are just of a given size, and, and, and we cannot really uh, weak scale the way um, other fields like uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics can obtain more science with, with, with using larger systems. However, um, new methods like uh, advanced uh, sampling methods do allow exposing more parallelism along different dimensions and essentially allow scaling uh, using uh, a, 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 a coupled set of, of uh, independent or paralyzed uh, ones. So here, what I show is 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 a, a loop how how typical such a run will look like. Where in our innermost regular step, we sample, uh, we do our MD sampling, 
then occasionally we calculate an, uh, an AWH bias, for instance, with the, the AWH method. And then uh, depending on the, the frequency requirements of the, the problem, occasionally we do a bias sharing step. And this, in this setup, um, we can parallelize better because we only need to, to tackle the strong scaling parallelization challenge for the innermost gray gray loop and the outermost uh, uh, blue dashed loop here it can scale uh, across uh, many nodes um, without being hampered by by the strong scaling parallelization so how does this look like in practice um, what this means is that we can use multiple work, walkers in a, in, a, in a coupled ensemble and, and uh, we can get uh, uh, more, even more than linear scaling. In this case, we show super linear scaling um, with multiple walkers, which can offset limitations of strong scaling when the problem allows. So for instance, um, on the right side, I show hours to solution with the number of GPUs. And as you can see, uh, we get very good uh, scaling down to 16, even uh, 32 walkers, and uh, both with one GPU per walker and four GPUs per walker, thanks to the good parallel efficiency um, across the multi walker simulations, which is shown on the right here uh, with dashed. Uh, I show the parallel efficiency with multiple walkers, which is 85 to 90 percent, even up to 32 walkers on a noisy uh, production machine uh, that is uh, um, CSC's Pukti here. And uh, on the left, left side, I show the, the, the performance uh, uh, per AWH walker here. And as you can see, we get uh, even for such a small system. In this case, it's uh, an aquaporin uh, um, channel with uh, ninety thousand atoms. We get uh, more than a factor of two performance improvement from one to four GPUs. So that is pretty pretty decent, even even in terms of strong scaling. And in addition, uh, feature that we have added is uh, so called flex sharing where where the sharing does not need where not all simulations need to be coupled and and uh, uh, different parts of the simulation can exchange biases while others can can uh, proceed completely independently which allows uh, more efficient um, scheduling and 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 less work in terms of scheduling simulations because one can just use uh, Gromax's multi-deal functionality In closing, I would like to acknowledge um, the work of um, colleagues and collaborators. Um, among them, uh, a lot of this work wouldn't have been possible with uh, the contributions from uh, Berk Hess and uh, uh, Artem Zmurov, uh, Andrei Alekshenko have, have contributed a lot to the GPU code. Um, and uh, in, ad in addition, um, I would like to thank Alan Gray and uh, Gaurav Gard from NVIDIA, with whom we have collaborated on the co-design projects. And with that, um, I will close here and we'll take questions. All right, thanks for the, the talk. It was really interesting and detailed. Yes, yeah, so and now we have the... Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom. So if I begin, uh, so we have a question from Arno, which I'll read out. So I think Sheila side slide on GPU direct communications between nodes showed comms going via CPU host memory and fire InfiniBand. If MV link or MV switch connections between nodes are available, will direct GPU communications as they have been implemented make use of this instead of going via InfiniBand? So 
So the answer to that is, is um, I go back to that slide quickly. Yes, the answer is yes. Primarily because, because um, when it comes to internal communication, we chose to to rely on on the implementations in MPI. Now there are um, there is exploratory work ongoing to to use more efficient libraries for communication. But in case of of NV link uh, or NV switches, uh, if we just switch if, if we just swap out this yellow box, which is InfiniBand here, with NV switch, uh, we will we will be able to communicate through those NV switches uh, equally efficiently and actually more efficiently because the overhead of uh, of, of going from, from uh, this GPU to that GPU will be lower, the bandwidth will be higher, but it will be transparent because we rely on MPI. Thanks. Um, so a question from Valeria. Uh, are you planning to release tabulated potentials with GPU acceleration? I am not familiar with the features planned for the upcoming releases, so I cannot comment on that. But I am um, confident that that uh, when such a feature gets implemented, we will strongly consider um, GPU acceleration part. Okay. Uh, so then we have a question from Ali, which says, thanks for a nice talk. Is CUDA toolkit necessary to install for compiling Gromax with a graphics card? To answer that question, I'll quickly go back to this, to this table. Um, the answer to that is no, it is not. That is why these, these additional two columns are here. And that's why um, um, it mentions in both of these columns that there is NVIDIA, oh, sorry, the last column doesn't, uh, it does mention it. Uh, all, all the last, both last columns are, are viable solutions to target NVIDIA GPUs. In particular, the middle column, OpenCL, is a viable solution. However, if you need performance, I would recommend, I would strongly recommend uh, using NVIDIA CUDA because because in terms of performance it is it is uh, the best uh, approach. Um, so I have a question for you, which is um, so in terms of system size, you get this sort of you get a limit of where you can't really use more GPUs if you need to compute the PME. So is there a system size where you're better off just using a pure CPU system because of the better strong scaling? Um, yes, that is true at the moment. Um, to answer that question, in a general way, in general, it does not need to be the case. And um, I will try to explain that quickly with this slide. So. When it comes to CPUs, most CPU systems do not have any of these additional complexity here. It's just straight the CPU going to the network, through the network to the other CPU. Now, on current machines, there is always an added complexity in terms of hardware, which does, does have a certain amount of overhead. And there is an added complexity in terms of the communication libraries, which needs to handle this complexity. And the, the combination of the two does add an inherent overhead to, to, to strong scaling um, molecular simulations. Now, what, what will be uh, coming in the next generation hardware is better integration. And an increasing level of integration will, 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 will remove these additional boxes and additional additional complexities uh, in hardware, and we can only hope that that the software will keep up and MPI will allow better scaling across GPUs to GPUs. That said, uh, there is just simply a, a, a very hard limit to how far can you parallelize um, FFTs and uh, distributed FFTs will not scale. Um, very well past a couple of nodes and uh, past a couple of, of um, CPUs or GPUs. And therefore, uh, the main solution to that, I think, is, is uh, looking into different algorithms. Uh, for instance, uh, um, 
cast multiple method could allow um, better scaling on next generation architectures. Okay, yes, we have a question from uh, Vedran, which is, uh, what is the performance of Sickle on modern AMD GPUs? Is it comparable to CUDA on modern NVIDIA GPUs? Thanks, Adrian, for the question. That's um, indeed an important question. Uh, one caveat is before I comment on the, the performance, uh, things are changing fast and therefore uh, improvements to many of these components are, are expected. Uh, that said, currently our, um, our sickle support is, is stable but preliminary. However, the performance on a single GPU um, is quite good, I would say uh, maybe 20 to 30% lower at worst compared to the native. And uh, we are working on improving that. Uh, I see no reason, no, no strong reason why we could not um, get nearly on par performance by the time the, the the machine, the AMD machines arrive and our main target, I, I let me just emphasize our main target for now is the, the big pre exascale machines. Um, and next we will look at um, the commodity hardware and and, uh, and gaming GPUs when those get enabled in the software stack. So so we, we should be able to get on par, performance on par with the native when it comes to single GPU performance. Going beyond that, I think a lot will depend on, on the maturity and performance of the, the communication libraries and, and runtimes. And there, there is still, um, I expect that some, uh, there is some gap will remain in NVIDIA's libraries and, and, and communication support in, in MPI is, is far better. So when it comes to, to strong scaling, uh, even though our, our algorithms and implementation are, are highly portable, I expect that uh, when we compare, and these machines arrive and we compare, for instance, Sickle on NVIDIA with MPI to, to our CUDA where MPI based implementation, there will be a significant difference. Okay, so I think we might better leave it there for questions unless there's any more. So um, I'll leave Alessandra to tell you about our next webinar that we'll be having. Next by Excel webinar will be on one of the use case that we have uh, and one of the tools also that we have uh, in by Excel. So it's more, and it's uh, by Vitas Capus, and it will be on Gromax PMEs for large scale alchemical protein ligand binding affinity screening. And it will be, the 21st of April, that is a Thursday, not that just pay attention that is a Thursday and not a Tuesday, as usually we have the webinar. Okay. And also the following webinar will be on news case that are deal inside BioXL to at the end of June. So I thank you all the attendee for attending and for asking questions. And I thank you very much, Shilar, to join us and to give a webinar to the BioXL webinar. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.